On this episode, we talk with architect John Westbrook about his plan for Bethesda, Maryland. Then we head west to Portland, Oregon, where the conflicts between traffic calming and emergency response required communication and compromise. We look at the peculiar placement of historical markers. We go on a 10-kilometer Volksmarsch walk up the Crazy Horse Monument. And finally, we find out why Corning, Iowa received a Main Street Award. Stay tuned. We're in Bethesda, Maryland, talking with John Westbrook, who's an architect with Placemakers. What is Placemakers? Well, as the name says, uh, we make places, uh, do a lot of urban design work, particularly focused on Bethesda a number of years ago while Chief of Urban Design. And uh, that's what we're here today to talk about, I think. Okay. At the corner of Bethesda and Woodmont Avenue here, you spent a lot of time, your own time recently, looking at some of the problems here. What's the problem with Woodmont Avenue? Well, really, what started this uh, was the concern for not being able to get across Woodmont Avenue. Uh, it's a very heavily traveled street. Uh, it's one way now. Cars go 50, 60 miles an hour right downtown. And it's a real pedestrian nightmare. You can't be crossed. The other thing that got me interested was the opening of the uh, tunnel for the extension of the Crescent Trail. Uh, there's a lot of use of the trail right now. And when that tunnel opens, that use is going to intensify. And what is now a problem of conflict between pedestrians and cars is going to come, become worse when that happens. So that's really what got me started. And then once I started that, then other things flowed. Okay. Ports of Woodmont are one way, and other ports, they're two way, but they're quite wide to cross. What sort of solution did you come up with? Well, my suggestion is that Woodmont Avenue be made one turn from one way now, for, which is just a short section only two blocks to two ways the entire length. Right now, when you're in the southern part of Bethesda over near Barnes & Noble, and you want to get up to the Woodmont Triangle, to say, to go to dinner or something like that, it's a very convoluted and confusing. Uh, also, coming out of Metro, you actually come and use uh, the local street, Arlington Road, quite a bit. By making it two ways the entire way, what that's going to do is tend to calm the traffic because it'll be going in both ways. You'll have more lights available for pedestrians across. And, and another major benefit will be that the bikeway that presently would just really terminated could connect up to Metro Center uh, on both sides of Woodmont Avenue in a very simple, straightforward way. Uh, and, and another problem that's going to be coming soon is uh, uh, people trying to cross uh, from the new development that's taking place right at Metro Center. And right on Montgomery Lane near the library, new townhouses have recently been completed and more to come. And so you're going to have a lot more people walking on the streets, particularly at the intersection of Woodmont Avenue and Montgomery Lane, and they can't cross right now because there's no light, and cars continuously move there. So you're going to see people crossing anyway, and the, and the chance for a real serious uh, uh, wreck uh, and pedestrian uh, traffic uh, hazard is going, to, is going to be there. And the plan you've come up with, does it have more traffic signals than the existing situation or are they just moved? Well mainly it's just a relocation so that the timing of the traffic signals is much more regular and understandable. Right now uh, you you have a light right at uh, as you enter into the metro itself it's really a light for a private garage and uh, by just moving that light down to the intersection of Montgomery in Woodmont you're not adding lights you're just making them a more effective and more regular and therefore more understandable and, uh, and therefore more calming. And changing uh, a different aspect of this, uh, the tunnel, it's only going to be open during the day, it might be closed late at night. Yes. Uh, what alternatives do we need to take care of the, the off hours for the tunnel? Well, when the sector plan was redone in 1994, one of the proposals that was made at that time was to create a new two-way bikeway system that would link the Crescent Trail uh, at the intersection of Woodmont and Bethesda all the way over to Elm Street Park and then through to the continuing of the trail to Silver Spring. What I'm suggesting is that with the tr trail under the tunnel opening and but then closing at night, that's going to create a, a, a problem for those that want to begin to use the trail. It's also hard to get up to Bethesda Avenue uh, if you're a biker or, or even walking. The sidewalks become narrow. Uh, in front of Weichart Realtors, 
Uh, by having a two-way bikeway there, it will uh, really ease the flow between the west side of Bethesda and over to Elm Street Park by the Women's Farm Market. And um, uh, so I'm saying let's go ahead and implement that in a timely fashion shortly after the opening of the tunnel. You get over to the other side of the tunnel, uh, some of the connections from the trail to access to the trail are lacking. Yes, again a problem. The, 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 with success will come other problems. Success meaning the more people that use the trail, uh, the more people will want to access it. And when you try to get to the trail from per Pearl Street, which is the street where McDonald's is located, you can't get there from here. There are no sidewalks, even if there were a connection, and there's not a connection planned. So one of the things that Doug Duncan did when he uh, approved the uh, opening of, of the trail, it was six months after the opening of the trail, they wanted to assess what were the other opportunities and problems that might could be addressed. And I'm saying one of those things would be to create a ramp connection to the trail along Pearl Street. And then having done that, there are about two blocks of sidewalks that need to be built. That connection should be made. And then the people that li live in the um, East Bethesda area would then have a front door to the trail and they would have better access to the rest of the downtown area as well and they would then begin to walk to Bethesda Avenue, Barnes and Noble and it would tend to enliven that, this whole area and make it much more friendly and more walkable and therefore a better place to live and work. So, so how would you rate Bethesda for pedestrians at the moment? Well I'd say uh, it's a lot better than it was, uh, uh, no question about that. Back in the 70s, it was a nightmare. But what's happened now, it's become much more pedestrian friendly and therefore people's expectations have been increased. And, and now they think it's worse than it was then. It's actually not, it's better because we have 13 miles of uh, sidewalks that have been improved over 42 block faces, uh, quite an enhancement of the pedestrian way. But we've got a long way to go. Uh, uh, there's another problem coming too. The intersection of Bethesda Avenue and Woodmont is a, is a real nightmare. If you look behind us right now, it's over 150 feet of pavement from one end to the other and very hard to cross. Uh, with the free right-hand movements, there's always conflicts between cars and pedestrians. The bikers who try to get through here, they're always having a problem. It's in the morning now, so you don't see the problem quite as intensely. But if you were to come in the evening about 6 o'clock, uh, and try to get across, you'd see what I mean. People are constantly crossing illegally. Women and men pushing their baby carriages can't get across, but they do anyway. Uh, this whole configuration needs to be changed. And that's part of your plan, <coughs> converting the streets and improving the intersection? Yes. Uh, um, it's, it's really not just my idea. A number, about a year or so ago, a federal realty suggested making that kind of an improvement but it just didn't go anywhere for reasons that I'm not aware. I think some of their ideas were, were good, and so I'm just re, uh, resurfacing some of those ideas and then changing them a little bit so that the bikeway system and pedestrian as well as vehicular can be thought about in equal measure. What's been happening in our country even is that the car is winning and, and the pedestrian is losing. And I want to even that balance a little bit. In fact, maybe even orient more towards the pedestrian in the urban areas and let the cars maybe slow down a little bit in deference to pedestrians and bikes. In that way, the cars are going to get their way anyway, uh, but the pedestrians and bikers at least have a, uh, an even chance. Uh, they need more than an even chance to succeed, and I think Bethesda can give them that. And, I, and so I'm excited about it. It's, 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 it's not as good as it can be. It's been a lot better. Uh, than it was, and uh, I just think that it can be better than it is. We're talking with Crystal Atkins, who's project manager with the Traffic Calming Division of the Bureau of Traffic Management, the City of Portland. Portland's been doing traffic calming for how long? We've had a traffic calming program since 1984. Uh, we began on local service streets and um, it began through citizen demand. Um, we have done a number of projects and in 1993 we actually expanded our program to begin working on neighborhood collectors, which are truly arterials, but they're the residential arterials. In many cities, you have a 
conflict between emergency services who are concerned about getting someplace fast and traffic coming, which is trying to get traffic to go slow. Yes. Uh, how does that develop here in Portland? Well, initially, to be honest, the Fire Bureau in particular was not particularly happy that we were um, doing traffic calming, but we were working on local service streets. Oftentimes there were routes that they didn't necessarily use on a regular basis. Uh, so I would characterize it as they grumbled, but they kind of ignored us for a while. When we moved, there were two things that happened in about 93, 92, 93. We began using speed bumps in 92. And by speed bumps, they're often called humps in other jurisdictions. We chose to call them bumps here, and we have two different designs that we use. Um, uh, so they began seeing a lot of bumps out on the street. And then in 93, we expanded the program, as I said, to start treating neighborhood collector streets. Now, the streets that we started to treat were streets that the Fire Bureau just never assumed that we would touch. I mean, they were, they were quite dismayed because they were some of the more regular routes for them. Um, so we began having some um, discussions about their concerns. They had some concerns about what happens when you get a bump on every street. How are we going to, to be able to get through there and meet our response times? And we agreed that it was a concern, that we needed to look at this. So we began um, to, to do some work and figure out um, how can we quantify what this problem is. And how did you quantify it? Well, we spent about a week out in the street. The Fire Bureau was wonderful. They gave us a lot of resources. We chose six different typical kinds of fire vehicles to test. We had crews. We had two drivers for each of the vehicles. Because one of the things we wanted to take out of the equation, one of the variables, was is this related to um, uh, which driver and does that affect the the slowing that you would see going over slowing devices. Um, so we spent a week out in the field doing using a stopwatch, using a video camera, uh, quite a scientific study on what happens with these six typical vehicles when they either go around a traffic circle, go over a 22 foot bump, or go over a 14 foot bump. What sort of results did you get? Well, we found some interesting results. Um, we, as I said, we tested the six different typical vehicles, uh, fire vehicles, on traffic circles, 22-foot bumps, and 14-foot bumps, which are the three slowing devices that we use here. Um, the shorter the wheelbase on the vehicle, the less effect either any of those devices had on the vehicle. The longer the wheelbase on and the heavier piece of equipment that we looked at, the more impact any of the three devices had on them. Um, we came up with a range of times uh, as to what the delay was for particular devices and particular pieces of equipment. We have a pretty extensive report that, that lays all of those things out. So what happened then as a result of this report? Well, we had really hoped initially that it would allow us to use it as a planning tool. And the theory was if we were looking at, you know, any particular street segment and say we were planning on putting, you know, four 22-foot speed bumps on, we were hoping that we would be able to say, okay, worst Worst piece of equipment, that would be a 10 second delay per bump, so we're adding 40 seconds to the response time. Their current response time is 2 minutes 30 seconds. We have a 4 minute response time goal. Therefore, it's okay to put four bumps on. Didn't work like that. Didn't, it, it was really good quantifiable information. Um, which helped us understand what was going on, but it, the, our planning hope for this information didn't work out. So what alternative did you come up with then? Well, after doing some um, interesting arguing together, um, what we decided to do is, is work together to develop a new classification for our transportation element. We have um, a planning document that designates various different designations for 
each of the streets in the city. We have five different traffic designations, and that was really kind of the base document that we were working worked from. It's also the base document that traffic calming works from. So when I say local service street, that's one of the designations in that transportation element. So we decided we needed another um, classification, an overlay, if you will, that would develop a network of um, emergency response streets for the city. How difficult was that to do? It uh, turned out to be a lot more complex than we thought it would be. Um, to begin with, we started by doing an extensive background report because we knew we wanted a citizen's advisory committee. What we knew also is that traffic calming staff knew traffic calming and that fire staff knew fire really well, but neither one of us understood each other's business very well. So um, there were three staff people um, from different from the different elements, if you will, that came together and worked on a background document, both for ourselves and for our Citizens Advisory Committee. And those three were a uh, staff person from fire, staff for person from traffic calming, and a staff person from transportation planning. Um, once we got the background document together, we formed a Citizens Advisory Committee and uh, worked with that group to come up with some good criteria on uh, what should this classification system look like, what should it do for us, and then eventually what uh, we, we ended up mapping the, the, the streets. That's, how long did this whole process take? Well, from start to finish, it was about two years. And approximately the first year was background report, um, a little less than that. And about a year was citizen advisory committee. And this, this group was incredible. We met every other week for about eight months. Are people happy with the results now? People are very happy with the results. We did three open houses throughout the city when we were done with the product because we always check in with the public at large. And we had really good comments and reviews. Not everybody's delighted, um, particularly those folks that ended up on a street that um, would have been eligible for slowing devices but are not today. But um, basically the comments were very, very good. What suggestions would you have for another city concerned about the conflict between slowing traffic and speeding up emergency response, what could they learn from what you've done? Well, there are a couple things. I think part of what we did right was to quantify what was going on. Um, and sometimes that's not easy to do. What we found was that a lot of, particularly the fire issues, were a lot more complex than, than we thought in the beginning. Um, but it's really good to be able to have data because the perceptions of the fire bureau and the perception of traffic calming staff were often quite different as to what was going on. So to quantify was, was really helpful. Um, from there to be able to develop with a group of people criteria on how to judge, um, to, how to make the decisions you need to make was really important. And I think that's one of the reasons why the product is as positive as it is. And then quite frankly, it goes right back to relationships. You need to build good relationships, trust relationships. Um, we're in a much better position now, both the Fire Bureau and ourselves, because we have we have built good re relationships, and we both understand each other's business a lot better. So we can do a better job at even planning our projects because we have, we can take into account more uh, of what the Fire Bureau needs are. We're on Chain Bridge, which connects Virginia with the District of Columbia across the Potomac River. It's three lanes of heavy traffic with a sidewalk on the upstream end. There's a long, interesting history to this bridge, but we don't know what it is. There are some historical markers on the Virginia side, but they're on the downstream side. Driver going by, unless they're stuck in rush hour traffic, wouldn't have time to read them. Pedestrian on the other side of the street can't get to them. People who put the markers in place didn't stop to think that 
The driver going at 35 doesn't have time to read and shouldn't be reading, should be paying attention to the road. Whereas a pedestrian strolling along at three or four miles an hour has plenty of time to stop and read. Might make sense to move the markers to the other side of the street. We're talking with Buzz Donenworth of the Black Hills Volksport Association. What is the Black Hills Volksport Association? It's a group of probably about uh, 250 people and we do Volks marches or walks, 10 kilometer walks uh, all over. And then we set up uh, year round walks where you can walk year round any time of the day, anytime you want to at different places like Rushmore Mall, um, Spearfish and Rapid City. We have several of those. <clears throat> we have uh, walks just during the summer and uh, we've got several of those set up and then we have weekend walks. And, and you, you had one of those going on today. Right. This is the Crazy Horse Monument behind us. For right. most people, probably recognize it. What's special about this walk? Uh, this is, happens to be the largest walk in the United States, so we're quite proud of it. <clears throat> and uh, the rest of the states kind of jealous, but uh, they they all come and visit with us. And actually, we have a lot of our uh, volunteers from other states come and help us from all over the country. How many people? The, you may beat it this year, but what's the record so far for people? A little over 13,000 is the record. <clears throat> but uh, right now we've got over 11,500 the past two days, and then we've still got tomorrow. What should people expect on this walk? What kind of people? Do you have to be a mountain climber, or, or who do you see in the, all those people showing up? No, it's just anybody. We, we've had people uh, up to 89 years of age. Uh, we've had, yesterday we had one guy walk with two canes. We've had all sizes of people, little kids, everybody. And they have a lot of fun with it. Uh, it and they visit, you know, and uh, it's just, it's wonderful to go up on top, on top the arm. The view is tremendous. So it's, it's just a challenge and people like to do it. For a free pedestrian action kit, write to the Campaign to Make America Walkable, care of the Bicycle Federation of America, 1506 21st Street Northwest, Suite 200, Washington, D.C., 20036. We're talking with Ken Rummer, who's president of the board of Main Street Corning. What is Main Street Corning? Main Street Corning is a program to revitalize our downtown. And it's a program that comes through the National Trust for Historic Preservation and uh, the Iowa Main Street program. What is it that you do? Well, we try to do several things. Uh, we're interested in how the community looks in the downtown's appearance. Uh, uh, fixing up storefronts is one example of that. Working in the park is another one. Uh, we're also concerned with the businesses in the stores uh, to in assist them and encourage them as they're trying to be successful in our community on Main Street. Uh, How did you get started? Uh, actually, personally, I got started because uh, there was a huge uh, application to write, and uh, one of the members of the community came to me and said, you use words for a living. How about coming and helping us write the application? So. That's how I got started in this, and somehow now I'm the president of the board. What, what were the problems that your community faced that you started this program? Well, like a lot of the small communities in Iowa, uh, with declining rural uh, numbers of people, uh, it became harder and harder to maintain a, a downtown and maintain the retail uh, stores that we had. Uh, we also had the loss of one of our larger uh, local industries in the community, over 100 jobs. And so it was uh, an attempt to kind of fight back against that, uh, swim against the stream, and uh, maintain the viability of our community. And the National Trust for Historic Preservation just gave you one of their Main Street Awards. Why is it that Corning, Iowa received that award? Uh, because we were one of the five 
top uh, applications that they received this year. Um, they accept applications from communities all over the country. And out of those uh, maybe 70 applications that come in, they pick 20 as their semifinalists. And then out of those 20, they pick five. And uh, Corning was one of those. Um, I think maybe uh, it's our track record over the, the years that we've been in the program. This is now uh, since 1990 that we've been in Main Street program. And uh, there's a whole uh, record of achievements there from our community that they were able to look at and how we were able to deal with some of the adversities that had come our way. And what were the key things that you did that caught their attention? Uh, they really look for public-private partnership, uh, it, the involvement of the city and the county and the utilities, uh, I think really helped us there. Uh, as they've been big players in the Main Street program here, uh, seeing this as part of their job to uh, help maintain the life of the community. Uh, they also, uh, I think, were impressed with uh, what we were able to show them in the way of our storefront renovations, where we've been able to uh, reclaim some of the character of the turn of the century buildings that are the predominant buildings in our downtown area. Uh, and we also have a, a large public improvement project uh, going up at the park near the courthouse, uh, where we've, uh, it's really about a 10 year program, and we're about seven years into it. But uh, there's a uh, restored fountain, cast iron fountain in the middle of the park, a uh, pavilion for the band and the farmer's market, uh, a veterans memorial uh, area. And uh, just this year we're going to be breaking ground this week for uh, a new entry from the downtown side of the park. So what are your plans for the next few years? Uh, people ask us that at the national uh, meeting. Uh, what are you going to do next after winning this award? And uh, I guess they were afraid we might just stop or something, but uh, uh, what I've been telling people is we're going to keep swimming against the stream. It's, uh, it's always a challenge uh, for a smaller community to maintain its life and its uh, livability, uh, but that's our, our goal and our task that uh, continues to uh, do what we can to help that happen. Visit us on the internet at www.pedestrians.org.